afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Today we have beautiful landscapes, magnificent flowers, and gorgeous gardens to share with you. With the calendar showing January, our horticultural expert Leonard Perry has selected a series of his favorite garden books that will not only help pass the time until spring, but will also expand your gardening knowledge. So welcome, Leonard. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, Judy. With so many books out there, how do you pick your favorites? Well, it's really hard. It's kind of <laughs> like how do you pick your favorite flower when you have hundreds in bloom out there. Right. But, uh, well, some of these are the ones that, you know, are right there on top of the desk at the moment, mm -hmm. like the flowers that are in bloom. Some are ones that I've used. Uh, repeatedly over time. Others are just new ones that are quite pretty and uh, we'll start with a couple um, that are ones I use in my courses. Um, to try to bring a diversity today no matter people's um, interests and so you can see a whole range of different books. So what are some of the subjects that we're going to touch on today and, and where are we going to start? Well, we'll start with these books for the two new courses. I've got one winter session on perennials and pollinators, perennial plants, mm -hmm. and then one for my new summer course on herb growing, home herb growing. So we'll start with the pollinators. Pollinators are a really important uh, plant and um, are topic, topic now in plants and gardening. Of course, they're having a lot of issues. And so it's good to help these, not only because we like to look at them like butterflies, but of course the bees, which one of the main pollinators are, you know, having some issues and they're so important for our food crops. So this book by Heather Holm is just a great one as it goes through just so much. It's a fairly small book, but it covers a lot. That's why I use it for a quote text in my course. There's four main, well, several chapters, but the first starts off with general about pollination plant parts. It shows some of the uh, pollinators, how the plants and the bees and other pollinators interact, and just kind of gives a good overview uh, so you get a feel for, you know, when you're talking about plant parts and what they're going for. And, mm -hmm. and then it goes into some of these pollinators, like different types of bees and, of course, some of the butterflies, which are not as efficient, but it also covers things like beneficial insects, which are going for nectar in addition to eating their prey. And uh, But they're a very important part of our gardens and uh, keeping other pests under control and even things like flies that we may not think about and wasps and uh, such as that. So and then we go in, in the third chapter in this book, uh, pollinator conservation, just you know why it's important to conserve them and ways to go about it, things you should and shouldn't do with a really useful checklist. And then a lot of the book is divided into three sections, prairie, woodland edge, and wetland edge plants. And here's an example of one, a yellow coneflower, a native plant, when it blooms, uh, where it grows, uh, some of the cultural things, and then the next page about the, whether it hosts larvae, which is important, and uh, some of the pollinators like the bees and some in-depth information. So really good information, just a lot packed into there. Excellent. And so you also have something with um, herbs? Yes. Um, as I mentioned, through continuing mm -hmm. distance education, I'll be doing homegrown herbs this summer, and, um, or home herb growing, and this is the book Homegrown Herbs by Tammy Hartung. Uh, and this is a really good book because it goes through all the aspects of herb growing. And from design, here's a great I illustration saying start small. Right. It's so tempting to get big, <laughs> but idea. you know, as you say, upper corner, maybe uh, you know, several uh, foot square bed, and then next year it shows you can expand it more and then maybe get exciting the third year and add curves to it but start small you, you often see beds like this and say oh that's what I want but mm -hmm. it takes a lot of maintenance to make a knot garden like this and maintain it so you know just tips like that some beautiful color pictures a lot of designs here's a children's herb garden with the plants shown in there and the graphic and some pictures and labeled as well and then um, going through the culture and then in the back of course the harvest that's important an A to Z listing here in the names and parts to harvest, when to harvest, all those things you really uh, helps you have success. And then of course recipes, how to use it. And on the right, it's one of my favorite. It's a vanilla ice cream sundae with chocolate and lemon balm. Mm. And then on the left is one which is just very simple. It's mint in uh, fruit infused water. And that's something you can do at home. And actually I brought uh, an infuser. I've, I got this last year. I love. You can just use it and put fruits and things in a, in a jar. But they have actually pitchers now with these. But this is an actual drinking container. And you can just take this center section out and put some fruits in it or herbs and then just put water in this and then you can drink right out of it and then it infuses right in there. So nice. something I got my wife one for Christmas and we're looking forward to using that. And actually we've got some frozen fruits we can put in now and make nice. this even in the winter.
winter. You make me thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on to other topics and books. Each year you do a series of garden author interviews. Who did you visit with most recently? Okay, this uh, year we visited with uh, one of the speakers at our <coughs> Vermont Flower Show. She's spoken uh, many times in Vermont, Carrie Mendez. In fact, she's speaking this March at a series of Gardener Supply and in Woodstock, Vermont in April. She's got a wonderful symposium. Carrie Mendez, you can find out about that on her website or go to Perennially Yours. Here's one of the books she's written uh, that we covered, the top 10 lists. And she's got a lot of these uh, very thin, but very, again, packed books. She's quite a good gardener and horticulture, so a lot of good useful information on these. But we also visited with her on a right-sized flower garden, too. All right, well, let's head into the UVM greenhouse then. And what we'd like to look at is your new book that uh, came out, The Right Size Flower Garden. Tell us, what is this topic about? Well, I think many of us, including myself, felt that our gardens were becoming unmanageable, that we weren't able to keep up with their demands. And so I wanted to write a book that would help people take a fresh look at their gardens and be able to continue to have the beauty and the enjoyment, but reduce the maintenance by at least 50%. So have gardens that fit our changing lifestyles, um, so we don't feel like we're a slave to our gardens, and a lot of us feel slaves sometimes to our gardens. So I wanted to bring back that first love of how we first garden, instead of feeling we've got too much out there. I to can totally up. relate. You know, my gardens seem out of control, and yet I'm not, you know, willing yet to give them up. But I realize I can't do as much. Yeah. I just don't have the time, don't have the energy I used to, it seems like. And so I'm um, really looking forward to seeing what's yeah. in here. So what can somebody find in this book for tips? Well, one of the, one of the things I um, kind of marry with, other, other than making it sustainable for me, and this answers your question, is also I try to bring in much more um, sustainable practices. So as we adjust our gardens, we need to embrace more low water, low fertilizer, um, low no pesticides, you know, building more natives. So that's, it's, much, it's as much about us being able to care for our gardens as it is caring for the planet. Having said that, the plants that I talk about in this book all have to be, the, you know, fit that, those traits. I, I can't have water hogs in my gardens. I need to have plants that are uh, pollinator friendly, uh, ideally no fertilizer. I mean, so these are the types of plants I'm recommending. Um, and also that have low care requirements as far as pruning, you know, so low prune needs, low deadheading for perennials, you know, all the things that we want. We want our gardens to work harder for us than we do for them. And that's what I try to encompass That's a real good point, yeah, because there's so many things. And just by choosing different variety, for instance, different plant, you can have one that requires a lot less maintenance. And, exactly. and also, I assume, choosing the right plant for the right place exactly. will go a long way. So I guess there must be some design tips in here too, how exactly. to choose plants and place them. I talk about a lot of different cool plants, as you say, assessing where you're putting them so they're in the right place right from the get-go. Um, and I also talk about um, being more aware, as you say, of plants that work for us in our areas. One of the things that I know I ruffle a lot of feathers with some folks is I basically have walked away from most of the mop head hydrangeas, the big leaf hydrangeas, because they demand so much water and they can be inconsistent bloomers for colder zones. And I'm turning more to panicle hydrangeas and smooth hydrangeas that provide such rewards and beautiful flowers and they're consistent bloomers and low water needs. And so a lot of these I'm doing switcheroos, what we have always gardened with and now, you know, they're better plants with less work and they, they please us more. Well, I can't wait to look at that. It sounds like a lot, not only for the low maintenance, but also sustainability, which is so yeah. key now. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thanks so much for being with us today. So Carrie wrote that book based on her own experiences, and you have some other recommendations that provide some practical advice as well. That's right, Judy. There's always um, good books for how to, like <laughs> Carrie's books. And one of the ones that's been out for a while is Caring for Perennials by Janet McConovich. Um, it's really a testament that how useful this is because it's still in print. It's, like I say, been out for a while. It's really the first book on this topic. Uh, it's a thin book, but again, packed with information. It takes you right through the season. So if you really want to know, okay, what should I be doing in spring or summer or fall, uh, this book talks about that. And basically, um, one of the things it has in each of these, it has a bed. She's taken one of her beds, Arthur's beds, and all these, these are all the plants in it labeled. And so you can kind of see what's there in each season takes you through kind of not only the chores in general, but then specifically in this bed, what should you be doing? So you can really see uh, de deadhead this or uh, divide that or stake this. So um, for instance, with the midsummer work here. So that's just an example of how to use that bed. And then there's some 
photos. Uh, this is fall, <laughs> and this is how to, and there's some diagrams too that show where to plant bulbs. And this is showing, okay, see those numbers? That's where bulbs are planted and in between. So you can really see, and it's like the author is almost there pointing, see this is where you plant them. Mm -hmm. And so that's really great. And then some great diagrams on staking, not only the methods here, as you see on the right, kind of an English style with the, the bent twigs, but then the stakes with the string between, and then how they look during, during the season. One of the things I find very useful is this it, an estimate, and it gives you something you can do too, is track the time. Uh, it takes for lawn, trees, annual flowers by season. So you can see, okay, um, and when you're thinking this winter about, well, I should put in a garden this size, you can think, okay, um, look at that time. Maybe I should maybe make it smaller, not, you know, <laughs> bite <laughs> off more so, than you can choose. So, so ambitious. Yeah. And so um, also, too, you've two good books for gardeners to have. You also have some advice that focuses solely just on gardens and their beauty. Well, before that, I wanted to show another one, um, just a how-to that's very really useful. Okay. And uh, this is, what's wrong with my plant? <laughs> Again, a question a lot of people have, <laughs> if you have garden basis. at all, yeah. And uh, they have actually several, the authors, Deerdorf and Wadsworth, have several of these books, what's wrong with my vegetable garden or whatever. Um, but it's really neat because there's a lot of color photos. It's kind of set up like a key. So, for instance, here, the whole plant is wilted, and on the left it says, you know, the plant, the leaves are green, and then you go to the right, but if they're not, you go down to the next, and um, it, so it, and it has a color, you know, diagram to that. The same with the leaves, so you can see if it's got chew marks, if it's got discoloration. So up top says they're discolored, so go to this page. So then you go to that page, and then it says, are they black? or the other color. So you either go down <laughs> to the next one or they're black, so you go to there and it could be one of two things. If you can rub the black off, then it's probably sooty mold, that's in the middle. So then you go to another page and then that shows you um, tells you about, okay, this is sooty mold, what it's about? And they say, yeah, that sounds right, and what causes it? And then there's actually a page that has the controls on it. So that's kind of how it does, so it really walks you through all these different problem so it's very easy and it's it's fun way and really can get to the clues a lot you know better Quicker. than yeah. some solutions which is great all right now on to the garden beauty books okay garden beauty books they're just any number of those and they're just fun you know mm -hmm. the, like you say eye candy this time of the year so I brought a couple uh, fairly new and out that's uh, I think neat. if you can't get to England if you, even if you can these are private gardens secret gardens of the Cotswolds um, and this is 20 different gardens in that central part of England and it's just there's an example of some oh of the gardens goodness. They're just beautiful. And even if you go over there, you may or may not be able to see these. Some of them are open one or two days a year under what they call a garden scheme in England where they raise money for charities by opening these private gardens. But you see the topiaries up there and, and the herbs and so forth. But just taking an example of one of these, Abbott's Wood, um, and then you see some description about that. But then you see some pictures of it, just overviews. I mean, that is just so typically British with the landscape and the little the stone work and the kind of little parterre and water features there. Um, just some very famous kind of design. Some of these were designed by famous people. And then uh, just an overview of some of the different flowers there. And just that kind of wildflowers down in the lower left. I would just love to walk through something like that. And the delphiniums, again, this time of year, are just some beautiful things to get inspired, maybe even get an idea for a plant for your own garden. Oh, awesome. I love it. And what else have you got? Okay, there's one more I wanted to <laughs> show here. Another one that's great, but back on this country, a rich spot of earth. Thomas Jefferson's Revolutionary Garden at Monticello by Peter Hatch. There's a reason I'm showing this too, in addition to being kind of really pretty and new. There's the um, Jefferson's Garden that they maintain at Monticello. And then here it is in the fall, so you can see just beautiful. And, and basically a lot of the plants that were grown in this period. And this book talks about that and what they do and why they do it. And here's an example of plants from the late 1700s that were grown there. Um, carrots and cabbages and beets and then a couple of uh, and then there's hops it it's interesting that Jefferson grew hops and actually bought them from the slaves too to do brewing way back in the mm -hmm. 700s. And here's a couple of melons, a citrus, citron melon on the left and a nutmeg melon. You know, some really heirlooms you don't see that he really liked and grew. And um, this is, again, written by the author is the uh, former horticulturist for over 30 years at Monticello. And the reason um, you can actually hear him is a symposium at Fort Ticonderoga, the King's Garden, in April. And so we uh, have information on my website on that and link to that under the events too. But you can actually hear this author. Uh, and there's my website, perrysperennials.info. Uh, 
various perennial pages. And so again, the Fort Ticonderoga King's Garden Symposium uh, in April um, on a Saturday, and he's a, a keynote speaker, and you can actually get the book, have him sign it, and hear more about Jefferson's Garden there. How exciting. Well, thank you so much, Leonard. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you.